Hey, this is Lauren. Today we're going to take a look at rigor and relevance. Um, and I'm going to introduce a framework for you to help you introduce this and implement this in your classroom. The first thing I want to do is I want you to take a look at some of these statements and decide whether you agree or disagree with them. So although some of these may sound like no-brainers to you, like, yeah, no, of course that's not rigor, or heck yeah, that's rigor, um, this is often how teachers address rigor in the classroom. So if they get it on their evaluation or they hear some, someone say, hey, we need to up the rigor in the classroom, this is usually how it's addressed. But let's take a closer look at what rigor truly is. So by definition, rigor is learning in which students demonstrate a thorough, in-depth ma in mastery of challenging tasks in order to develop cognitive skills through reflective thought, analysis, problem solving, evaluation, or creativity. Whew, it's a mouthful. Okay, so that's great. But how do I design and implement this in my classroom? So let's simplify things here. Um, according to Barbara Blackburn, she says rigor is creating an environment in which each student is expected to learn at high levels, each student is supported so that he or she can learn at high levels, and each student demonstrates learning at high levels. So in essence, rigor involves expectations, questioning, support, and demonstration of learning. If we take her definition apart, this is what we come to. And actually, I kind of stuck questioning in there. Um, but I'll explain why I did that in a minute. So according to Mrs. Blackburn, true rigor is the result of weaving together all the elements of schooling to raise students to higher levels of learning. That clears things up, right? Okay, no, maybe not. So let's go a little bit further. Do you truly believe that every one of your students is capable of learning? If you really do believe that, then we need to set high yet attainable expectations for our students. We've all heard the phrase that our students will meet the expectations we set no matter how high. And I agree with that as long as those expectations are reasonable. Can we expect a student who comes to us on a third grade reading level to pass the seventh grade reading EOG with a four or a five? Probably not. That's not very reasonable. But can we expect that same child to grow to a fourth grade reading level by the end of the year? Yeah. Should we expect that student to read passages on or maybe even a little above his or her level and then be able to answer some open-ended questions about what they read? Absolutely. My expectations may not have been the same for every student in my class, but each one of my students were expected to learn and to push themselves every day. So. The first part is expectations. Setting high expectations for every one of your students, no matter what level they are on. So the next component of rigor is questioning. We all know as teachers that we're supposed to ask more open-ended questions versus closed questions. However, in practice, I'm not sure how often we actually do this. A good practice for yourself as teachers is to record yourself teaching every so often. Then sit down and track the types of questions you ask. While you're doing that, also pay attention to who you're calling on. It's very interesting to see what you'll discover about yourself as a teacher if you watch yourself do it. If you're uncomfortable with recording yourself, maybe have a mentor or a colleague come in for a lesson and track that information for you. Okay, so we know that questioning is important. The answers that we accept from our students and our responses to those answers are just as important as the questions themselves in increasing rigor in your classroom. A teacher who is aiming for high levels of rigor will ask extending questions. And if a student doesn't know the answer, that same teacher will continue to guide the student with foundational questions to get an appropriate answer. So let's take a quick look at some research findings on questioning in the classroom. 
So research says that simply asking higher cognitive questions doesn't necessarily lead students to produce higher cognitive responses. And we see that every day in our classroom. Just because we're asking into questions doesn't necessarily mean that we're getting high level answers. Teaching students to draw inferences and then giving them practice in doing so, however, does result in higher cognitive responses as well as greater, greater learning gains. For older students, increases in the use of higher cognitive questions are positively related to increased teacher expectations about students' abilities, especially for those teachers who um, regard their students as poor learners. So I found that very interesting and very telling. Um, if you want to learn more about some of the research that's been done, check out the research on questioning techniques in the classroom. That's a resource that I've included under the valuable resources at the bottom of the page. I think you'll be surprised about what some of the research is saying. All right, so now back to rigor. That third element in a rigorous classroom is support. According to Barbara Blackburn, it is essential that teachers design lessons that move students from less challenging to more challenging work while providing supports along the way. That's the key. Additional scaffolding is the most important way to support students. There are many ways to scaffold instruction and resources, but providing the appropriate scaffolding does require careful planning. And we're going to talk about planning um, more a little bit later. So the last piece is demonstration of learning. What are your students doing? It is important that we provide opportunities to our students to show what they've learned, but the key here is at a higher level. The best way to get students to that higher level is through engagement. We know that when our students are engaged, they're more willing to put in time and effort. And we're going to talk more about this when we discuss relevance. Um, so that's coming. So you're probably thinking, okay, Lauren, you've defined rigor, you've told me what I need to do in the classroom to increase the rigor, but now what? Where do I start? So I mentioned that I was going to share a tool with you. This is called the Rigor and Relevance Framework. This tool was developed by the International Center for Leadership and Education as a means of examining curriculum, instruction, and assessment. It's based on two dimensions of higher standards and student achievement. The first dimension, which runs vertically to the left, is called the thinking continuum. It moves from acquisition of knowledge to the actual assimilation of knowledge. And this probably looks very familiar to you. It looks just like Bloom's, right? Well, it is. It's based on Bloom's. The second continuum was created by Dr. Bill Daggett, and it's the action continuum, or the application model. This continuum moves from the acquisition of knowledge, the same starting place as the first continuum, but it then moves to the application of knowledge. What are, what are our kids doing with what they know? So what might each one of these quadrants look like in the classroom? Let's take a look. Take a minute to look at these classroom examples in each quadrant of the framework. While you're looking at these, ask yourself, are these appropriate classroom activities? Is it ever appropriate to plan activities that would be classified as a Quadrant A activity? The answer to that is yes. When introducing new skills or concepts, we have to start somewhere, right? Is it necessary at various times during a unit to teach within each one of these quadrants? Yes. The key is to not stay just in A or B because they're lower level blooms. Those activities aren't necessarily requiring the higher level thinking skills required for rigorous work. So if you need to, you can pause the video here to um, examine this more closely. So remember, rigor can be measured by identifying the complexity of the required level of thinking to meet a learning goal. What level of blooms are we having our kids um, think at? So when you're designing activities, start with a verb at your desired level of thinking. And I have included in the resources here a verb list for you for each one of the quadrants. 
And then going through your unit or lesson plans and highlighting those verbs can really help you determine how truly rigorous your instruction is. If you're highlighting verbs and they're all falling within quadrant A or B, make an effort to somewhere within that lesson or a unit to bump it up one or two times to C or even D. Think about what you are having your students doing. All right, so moving on to relevance. So within the context of the framework, relevance refers to the level at which students actually apply their thinking and knowledge. And across the continuum along the bottom, there were um, two quadrants, but five different levels. So take a second and look at the levels and how they're defined in the box on the right. So we said rigor is designing instruction and activities that are going to make our students think in more complex ways and therefore higher levels of blooms. Relevance, on the other hand, is what allows our students to actually connect to what they're doing. We've all been asked that question by our students, why do I need to know this? Or when am I ever going to use this? It's relevance that is going to help us answer that question and get our kids engaged. So how do I make things relevant? The best way is to design activities or project-based learning within your classroom that are going to have your students solving real-world problems, using real-world technology and resources, and presenting it to a real-world audience of some sort, whether that's through a website, um, presenting at a conference, uh, writing a letter to a congressman, whatever. But these are the three kind of um, criteria for making things relevant for your students in the classroom. The last page of the ICLE document that I've attached to the, to the module um, contains an application design tree. This document can help you identify the level of relevance for your instruction as well as the activities that you're planning to have your students complete. So the framework is a very versatile tool. You can use it in lots of different ways. One way is it can be used to, in the development of your instruction and your assessment. It can also be used to help you measure your progress in adding rigor and relevance to your instruction. And you can use it to help you select appropriate instructional strategies to meet those learner goals um, and help them achieve. Okay, so how can we use the framework? Well, let's start with TPAC. Actually, with TPAC, it's a little backwards because it starts with technology, and I think it should really begin with content knowledge. What are your standards? What do you want to teach? What learner outcomes do you want to see? What standards and objectives do you want to meet? Here you can utilize the verb list and the application design tree in the ICLE document. The second way is to go through your unit and lesson plans. In determining your own current status with designing rigorous and relevant instruction, go through your plans and highlight the verbs that you see. Then compare those to the verb tree. In which quadrant are most of those verbs falling? If they're all falling in one particular quadrant, work to redesign your instruction so that you're bringing in other um, levels of thinking and application. When writing unit plans in the future, have your verb tree sitting beside you during planning so that you can be sure that you're varying the levels of thinking that you're requiring from your students. And finally, if your students can't connect and don't care about what they're learning, they're not going to invest the time or the effort to think deeply about it. That's why we have to be relevant. Again, think real world problems using real world technology for a real world audience. The application decision tree is a resource to help you move up that application continuum. So in closing, let's go back to the agree or disagree statements from the beginning. By now, we should realize that just piling more or harder work on our students is not technically rigor. Additionally, all of our students deserve the opportunity to participate in rigorous instruction. The key here is that it may look different for different students. Finally, assuming that just by teaching the standards is not is going to reach rigor, 
that's not really good practice. The standards are a starting place, but it's up to us to design instruction and activities around those standards that are going to require our students to evaluate and synthesize information in a way that has an actual impact on the world around them.